Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Sean Fansky, Editor-in-Chief of Medical Product Outsourcing and moderator for today's program. You've logged on to the MPO webinar, What's New with Reprocessing Validations for Reusable Medical Devices? Before we get started, I have, a co I have some housekeeping announcements. For those of you who are interested in the information you hear today, once the webinar is ended, or if you'd like to forward it to a colleague, this session will be archived for a year. The archive will be able to be accessed through the MPO website, which is at mpomag.com. Also, we will be accepting questions throughout the presentation. You can type your question into the box provided in the webcast window. We will collect all questions and hold them until the end, but please feel free to type in questions as you have them. To enhance your viewing experience today, feel free to customize your window, window display. You can move the windows around by dragging I'm sorry, by clicking on the top header space of each window and dragging them with your mouse. Also, you can activate the closed caption option by clicking on the CC button in your media player. Finally, share your reactions to the content being presented today with the emojis provided. Your feedback will be seen by today's speakers. And now, before I introduce those speakers, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, Nelson Labs, a Soterra Health Company. Nelson Labs is a global leader in microbiological and analytical chemistry testing and advisory services for the medical device and pharmaceutical industries. The company serves over 3,000 customers across 13 facilities in the United States, Mexico, Asia, and Europe. With a comprehensive array of over 900 laboratory tests, Nelson supports its customers from initial product development and sterilization validation through regulatory approval and ongoing product testing for sterility, safety, and quality assurance. Now let's get started. Today we're joined by two speakers from Nelson Labs, Brianna Barber and Griffin Kamek. Brianna has worked at Nelson Labs for over five years as a lab analyst study director, and regulatory affairs specialist. She is currently the consulting study director for the healthcare reprocessing department, focusing on cleaning and disinfection validations of reusable medical devices. In this role, Brianna is the primary contact for sharing expertise related to testing requirements, ensuring medical device manufacturers are set up for success for their regulatory submissions. Griffin has worked at Nelson Labs for over eight years, specializing in cleaning and disinfection validations of reusable medical devices. His current role as expert technical consultant at Nelson Labs involves providing assessments and justifications for reusable medical device validations for manufacturers, such as master product determinations, test method justifications, test failure risk assessments, reprocessing validation report summaries, and gap assessments. Now we'll begin with today's presentation. Griffin. Thank you for that introduction and thank you all for joining today. I am very excited to discuss what our uh, presentation is on um, <clears throat> surrounding what is new with reprocessing validations for reusable medical devices. Um, during this presentation, we'll talk about not necessarily um, how to perform these reprocessing validations, but what are some of the new requirements surrounding cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization validations for reusable medical devices um, that have come from um, updates to standards and other guidance documents in, um, that have been updated recently. Just as a quick agenda of what we'll discuss today, we will <clears throat> start by reviewing what, uh, what is a reusable medical device. Uh, just get a brief uh, review and overview, um, just to, to get a, an understanding of, of the types of medical devices we'll be discussing today. Following that, we will review the updates for cleaning validations and then the updates for disinfection validations. Um, following uh, that will review the uh, recent updates for sterilization validations. And then lastly, we will talk about some of those open questions or gray areas as we've uh, labeled them um, in the guidance for reprocessing validations of reusable medical devices. And we'll discuss some of the possible solutions for these uh, open-ended questions, you know, how to approach them um, and what questions and considerations you should be asking 
Um, if you have a, a reusable device that falls into you know, one of these gray areas as we've labeled it. So just as a quick definition of what a reusable medical device is, just again, as a, a refresher, this, uh, these are devices that are intended for repeated use on different patients with appropriate decontamination and other processing between uses. Uh, decontamination meaning cleaning, disinfection, and or uh, sterilization procedures um, <clears throat> that are to be done uh, or are to be performed between uses um, on patients. Uh, the category of reusable medical device is a pretty broad category. It can include devices that are invasive, non-invasive, um, and even non-patient contacting devices, you know. So devices such as surgical tools, you know, would be an, an endoscope. So those would be considered more of your more invasive uh, devices and are reusable um, in some cases. And then also, um, you know, Devices that you may not consider a reusable device, but still are, you know, would be items like monitors or surgical lights or blood pressure cuffs, uh, stethoscopes. These are all still considered reusable medical devices, though they may be a little bit um, less invasive and potentially non-patient contacting. <clears throat> so um, as we talk today, just keep in mind that um, Reusable medical devices are classified into three categories using what's called the Spalding classification. This is a way to categorize reusable medical devices um, based on how they interact with the patient and you know what the risk is um, to the patient based on that based on the intended use of the device. So devices that have no patient contact or you know, may contact intact skin are classified as non-critical devices. These are you know, the types of devices that I mentioned, those non-invasive those non devices. So items like blood pressure cuffs, uh, carts, monitors, surgical lights, items that have low risk associated with them. Uh, because, you know, they may not even contact the patient, or if they do, you know, they'll contact intact skin. Um, but, you know, they are still medical devices and still may be contaminated and as such need to be decontaminated between uses. The next classification it, um, are semi-critical devices. These are devices that are intended to contact mucous membranes and non-intact skin. So items like endoscopes, you know, speculums, trans, transesophageal probes, or transvaginal, transrectal probes. These are all uh, semi-critical devices. You know, they're not necessarily contacting sterile areas of the body, but they are still invasive uh, devices that are still contacting, you know, sensitive tissue and as such, um, you know, require a bit more processing than maybe a non-critical device uh, would require. And then the last classification are critical devices. These are devices that are intended to contact sterile areas of the body, um, you know, including blood pathway. Uh, types of devices that would be classified as critical are your surgical instruments, uh, you know, and the uh, end effectors of robotic devices, you know, devices that are going to be used during surgical procedures, you know, are your critical devices, um, and they carry the, the more risk associated with them, you know, because they are coming in contact with those sterile areas of the body. So as mentioned, reusable devices need to be um, decontaminated between uses on patients. And what that means is that they need to go through appropriate cleaning and disinfection or sterilization procedures. Cleaning being, meaning um, the removal of visible contamination from the device. Um, and then disinfection, uh, you, meaning the, um, uh, the, the ability to achieve a, a specific log reduction based on the disinfection level you're trying to achieve. And then sterilization, um, uh, achieving a certain sterility assurance level um, for your device. For disinfection, 
Um, you know, that process can either be through chemical or physical methods. And then sterilization, you know, that will either be done through moist heat, uh, sterilization, um, or ethylene oxide and VHP. Most reusable devices, you know, we see will go through sterilization. Um, <clears throat> we'll go through a sterilization procedure. And then within that, most will go through a moist heat sterilization procedure. Um, and then ethylene oxide and VHP are optional uh, alternative methods if, if that particular device may not be able to withstand uh, the, the conditions of a moist heat or steam sterilization. Now, when it comes to reprocessing validations, this is what we're uh, validating, is we're validating these processes. We're validating that the cleaning can remove, you know, that visible contamination, that the disinfection can um, achieve that specific log reduction, and that the sterilization can achieve that sterility assurance level. And it's important to note that these processes need to be validated separately and independently of each other. Um, <clears throat> Combination testing typically is uh, not um, is not allowed, um, though. Uh, you know, it may be appropriate in some cases, which we'll talk about a little bit later today. But um, it, you know, for for the most part, these processes will be validated separately and independently of each other, and that's what we are talking about today. Is we're talking about these reprocessing validations. Um, and what's new with the requirements surrounding um, these uh, these validations? We'll, as mentioned, we'll go through the updates for the you know uh, cleaning validations, the updates for disinfection, and the updates for sterilization validation. So at this time, I'll turn uh, the presentation over to Brianna, who will go over the updates to cleaning validations of reusable medical devices. <coughs> Thank you, Griffin. All right, so moving on, we are going to talk about the updates to cleaning validations. So to start off a cleaning validation, there, there's multiple steps involved. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of walk through what each one of those steps, what those steps are. Uh, to start out, typically, uh, the first step of a cleaning validation is to conduct simulated use cycles. These are repeated cycles of soiling, cleaning, and either disinfecting or sterilizing the device. Once we complete those simulated use cycles, we then can move into what I like to call the seventh cycle uh, or the actual cleaning efficacy portion of the test. So this is where we would soil the samples with a soil that would mimic um, clinical use, kind of mimic what the device would see, um, you know, in a hospital or clinic setting, whether that is blood, mucus, skin. Um, and then after we soil the devices, we're going to process through them through the cleaning. Uh, typically, that is a manual or automated method we would validate manual and automated separate. Um, following the cleaning, we would then move to the extraction of the samples. So um, there, there are multiple methods of extraction. Uh, you know, we could manually shake it, swab it, uh, sonicate it, and really we are just performing that extraction using a water. And then we would test those water extracts uh, for endpoints such as protein, hemoglobin, or total organic carbon. So just uh, some updates. As you can see, in the past four to five years, there have been a lot of change in the industry uh, related to these reusable device validations. Um, one of the biggest changes that we're going to discuss today is the publishing of AMI ST98. Uh, this standard is, re well, it did replace AMI TIR30. So I'm going to move on and kind of go into more depth related to ST98. So 
So these are the kind of highlights of the major changes we have uh, seen with Amy ST98 being published. Um, as you can see, there are, are quite a few. Uh, in ST98, simulated use cycles are identified, whereas in TIR30, they were not mentioned. Uh, there are some changes with sample size. Um, there is changes with the positive controls, extraction efficiencies. Uh, one of the biggest is going to be non-critical devices and kind of how we treat and validate those. Um, it, it's, it's kind of nice for manufacturers because the requirements for validation of non-critical devices are a lot less strict. Um, and then the last thing we will discuss is kind of the final results and the statistical impact uh, of those. To start off with simulated use cycles. So as I mentioned, these are multiple sequential cycles of, of the entire reprocessing or processing cycle. So, you know, we contaminate the device, we take it through the cleaning process, we would then disinfect or sterilize um, based off of the classification of device and, and uh, the IFU. So in Amy ST98, these simulated use cycles shall be performed for semi-critical and critical devices then during these simulated use cycles, we need to consider all of the worst case use of the device. So, you know, we need to consider um, the full range of motion of the device. We need to actuate the device during soiling. If, it, you know, if it involves cauterizing tissue, we need to consider doing that during these cycles. Uh, one thing is the number of these simulated use cycles is not determined in ST98. So it's not, you know, a set requirement of how many you need to have. But uh, we typically recommend six, and that is kind of the industry standard that's been around for, for a little while now is to conduct six cycles. Um, for non-critical devices, these simulated use cycles are not needed prior to that cleaning validation. Uh, typically, most of the time, uh, which I'll kind of get into a little further in the, in the presentation, um, non-critical devices at minimum just need to be visually clean uh, as part of the criteria for their cleaning validation. So there's not really much risk associated with accumulation of soil over time. Um, hence why these cycles are not typically required for these devices. The next topic uh, or change um, is going to be surrounding sample size and controls. So these are all the necessary controls uh, for uh, of cleaning validation. We have the positive device control. And in ST98, they're wanting to see three samples used for this. Um, so that would be three devices that get soiled and they do not get processed. They would just get extracted and a uh, exhaustive efficiency is typically is required and is performed. The next control is the positive sample control. So this is just a sample um, where we are spiking our extract fluid with the test soil, um, testing the lowest concentration. We then move into our test articles. So there's not a sample size defined in ST98, and I'll go into that a little further, but um, previously, three was kind of the, the sample size known, but there has been um, some discussions moving into six and nine for semi-critical and critical devices. So these test articles, they are 
the devices that get soiled, taken through the cleaning process, and then we would perform that extraction um, and test for those endpoints. The next is the negative device control. The negative device control is just one sample that goes through the cleaning process. The next is the negative sample control, and this is essentially just a blank. Um, we're using the same extract fluid in the same um, container as the test articles. The next uh, kind of discussion point is cytotoxicity. There's no requirement surrounding the, the sample size for cytotoxicity, but typically it is one to three devices. And these devices are those that will go through the cleaning process prior to um, that cytotoxicity test, just to ensure you know there's not any harm um, from detergent residuals um, remaining on the device um, that could essentially harm the next patient. So talking about the positive device control, uh, in ST98, it states that extraction efficiency shall be determined for cleaning validations. And there is now a recommendation for the kind of criteria surrounding um, that extraction efficiency. And that is that it should be greater than 70%. And that is also outlined in ISO 15883-5. And the extraction efficiency needs to be, we typically perform four extractions um, on, the one, on the positive device control, and that should be performed until 10% of that first extraction um, is remaining. <laughs> the extraction efficiency value um, is then used to calculate the correction factor that is applied to the test articles. For critical and semi-critical devices, a minimum of three positive controls shall be used. So that ends up totaling to those 12 extractions, four extractions per positive control. In some instances, it, it may be possible to uh, you know, justify using a smaller size, but you, you definitely need to have a good documented scientific justification behind that. Moving on to kind of the next change or discussion item is going to be sample size. So in ST98, the sample size should be determined based on the complexity of the device. Uh, you, you know, are, is the geometry difficult? Are there hard to clean areas, mated surfaces, um, you know, that sort of thing. Then data reproducibility, and of course the criticality of the device. Uh, for sample size, it is deemed sufficient uh, if the minimum number of data points are generated per analyte. So for example, three, six, or nine, um, depending on classification and that complexity of the device. Uh, all data points should fall below the acceptance criteria. So for example, protein, which has that acceptance criteria of 6.4 micrograms per centimeter squared, uh, all of those, for example, six data points need to fall below that criteria to be sufficient. And allowable variation of results from sample to sample. So this is kind of new. Uh, there, it's outlined in ST98 about standard deviation. Uh, so the sample size can be deemed sufficient if the standard deviation of the sample set added to that highest data point does not exceed the acceptance criteria, which I will go into a little more detail on that uh, later in the presentation. 
And as mentioned, there's not a sample size established in ST98, but it kind of has some examples. Um, and based on some previous discussions and just what we've seen, uh, we have alluded to six to nine devices for semi-critical and critical devices. So for example, for ro robotics, endoscopes, those critical surgical instruments, you're wanting to look at having a higher sample size, just because most of the time they are more complex. Um, and the more data you have, um, you know, it's, it's good to have more data for those complex devices. And then for non-critical devices, we have kind of alluded to three. Uh, so just three data points, uh, or at least three. Um, there might be some cases where a non-critical device is a little more complex and you might want to do more, but three is a good amount. So this is an example for data reproducibility. So let's say we have six data points for protein. Um, you can see that there are a couple that are higher there, that 4.5 and that 5.6 that are still below the acceptance criteria, but they are higher. Um, so in this case, you know, we've min we've generated the minimum number of data points. We have those six data points. Um, all of them are below that acceptance criteria. But when we take that standard deviation and add it to the highest value, so that 5.6 result, that exceeds the acceptance criteria. And at that point, there is some variability uh, issue. And to demonstrate accuracy and precision during the validation, it might be worth either increasing your sample size or in some cases, maybe adjusting your cleaning procedure uh, to be a little more uh, robust. Surrounding acceptance criteria, uh, as you can see, there are is protein, hemoglobin, total organic carbon, carbohydrates, and ATP. So these are kind of the, these are the criteria outlined in Amy ST98, and they are also outlined in ISO 15883-5. One thing to keep in mind uh, during your cleaning validations and, and as you're gathering your results, um, for submission is these alert levels in ISO 15883. Uh, so, so just keep that in mind when you're looking. There are these alert levels um, that are established, um, but the action level is not until it would exceed that criteria. And, and something to uh, also bring up is critical and semi-critical devices, you know, they need that visual inspection uh, after cleaning, and then we typically select two quantitative analytes. Uh, the most common we see are protein, hemoglobin, and, and total organic carbon, known as TOC. Uh, we don't see carbohydrates or ATP as often, but um, either way, when you're validating, you're going to want to have those two quantitative analytes for a semi-critical and critical device. And protein is going to be one that most regulatory bodies are going to want to see. Um, and then when it comes to non-critical devices, uh, at minimum, they just need that visual inspection. But in ST98, there is a section. Um, and in that section, it kind of lists some of these higher risk non-critical devices. So you know, a higher risk of cross-contamination between patient use or um, for accumulation of soil, maybe. And in those cases, it may be appropriate to evaluate one analyte, such as protein. And kind of branching more on those non-critical devices, um, so 
Griffin had talked about this, a non-critical device is a device whose surface either contacts intact skin or it does not directly contact the patient, but it could still see, you know, some organic soil or microorganisms um, like blood, bodily fluids. Um, and in ST98, it states right here, cleanliness for these devices should be determined by visual examination. <clears throat> ISO 15883-5 also, also references this. So a non-invasive medical device shall require visual examination only. And then in ISO 17664-2, which is about non, uh, relates to non-critical devices, uh, there's kind of something we wanted to bring up. And the, it states under this note too, the requirements for cleaning and disinfection are stated as separate clauses mm. in the document. However, if the steps are concurrent, the requirements of both stages can be considered as one. Um, so, for example, if you have a non-critical device and you are using the same cleaner and the same disinfectant for it, uh, so, for example, a super sani cloth, that, that's a very common uh, cleaner disinfectant you'll see at clinics and hospitals. Uh, it has that purple lid, uh, the famous purple lid, I should say. Um, but uh, if, if you're using that as your cleaner and disinfectant, your device is non-critical. Um, there is potential that you can perform a, a combination cleaning and disinfection study, um, you know, because it's kind of a one-step process where you're removing soil and killing microorganisms with these wipes. And we'll go into that a little bit further into the presentation. Um, but yeah. And I'm now going to turn it back to Griffin to go into disinfection validations. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so <clears throat> those were just the, the major updates for cleaning validations. Um, and now I will go into more depth uh, or into a little bit of depth with uh, the recent updates to disinfection validations. Uh, there hasn't been as, as many updates, but there are still some significant updates to these disinfection validations for reusable medical devices that we'll discuss today. Now, just as a quick note, when uh, in order to know if your device needs a disinfection process and whether you need to validate that process, um, it's going to depend on your device classification. So those non-critical devices and semi-critical devices, at minimum, need to go through a disinfection procedure as the terminal step, with high-level disinfection being the minimum requirement for semi-critical devices, and then low or intermediate-level disinfection being the requirement for those um, <clears throat> non-critical devices. So just as a quick overview of how a disinfection validation is performed, uh, the first uh, step in the process is the a uh, device is inoculated with the challenge microorganism and the, the microorganisms that uh, are chosen will be based on the disinfection level um, that you are trying to achieve. After the samples are inoculated with the microorganism, they are then taken, taken through the disinfection process, whether that be manual or automated, uh, just whatever disinfection procedure you are trying to validate. They are then extracted in order to recover any uh, microorganisms that may have survived the disinfection process. And then they are plated on appropriate auger. And those colonies are counted after incubation and a log reduction is calculated. Um, and then, <clears throat> um, and depending on what your disinfection level, uh, again, will depend on what your uh, log reduction um, criteria will be at the end. So that's that's the general overview of how disinfection procedures are um, are performed. Now, with uh, in the last few years, there have been some updates to documents that um, have affected disinfection validations. The main 
uh, update or the main document that was updated is the uh, Amy TIR 12. This was updated in 2020, um, as well as ISO 17664, which was split into two documents, a part one and a part two. Part one covers the requirements for critical and semi-critical devices, and part two covers the requirements for non-critical devices. Um, and then also ISO 1583-5, which was updated in 2021. Uh, these two ISO documents do contain some um, additional information on disinfection validations, uh, but primarily the, the, the main updates uh, to disinfection va validations we saw stem from the new revision of Amy TIR-12. And in this revision, it states that uh, it states that the four vegetative organisms that you are evaluating or that you evaluate for low and intermediate level disinfections should be uh, tested in separate and not mixed suspensions. Um, the concern here is that mixed suspensions can engage in competitive inhibition, which may result in a lower microbial recovery count uh, and a better log reduction calculation at the end. Um, and that may be due to the competitive inhibition and not necessarily the disinfection process. So Amy TIR 12, you know, states to test these four organisms uh, individually and separately in separate uh, inoculum suspensions. You know, historically they were done in groups of two as imaged here uh, with S. aureus and E. coli being grouped together and K. pneumoniae and P. aeruginosa being grouped together. Uh, but now that recommendation is to, or that, yeah, the recommendation is to evaluate them uh, not in mixed, not in those mixed suspensions. Now, if you have enough data, if you feel like you have enough data, and if you feel that you can write a, a strong enough scientific justification for testing in mixed suspensions, uh, then it may still be appropriate to uh, to use those mixed mixed suspensions. Um, but if, if you don't have that data um, and you don't feel that you would be able to write a, a, um, a good enough justification, then I wouldn't, I would not recommend using those mixed suspensions and I would recommend separating it out into those separate suspensions. The other update uh, in TIR 12 that I uh, wanna go over is just that um, the test article sample size is now undefined in this document. It did previously state to evaluate a minimum of three test articles or test replicates and one concurrent positive control. That verbiage has now been removed from Amy TIR 12 uh, and it's left as undefined. Now, it doesn't uh, give any further guidance on how to define a sample size or that you need to justify what sample size you use. Um, but it is just important to note that it's, you know, that verbiage has been removed. We do typically see three test articles being the typical sample size used for disinfection test or disinfection validations. Uh, but you may need more test article or you may need a larger test article sample size if you have a more complex device uh, like a endoscope or maybe a robotic device if you're doing a disinfection on it, uh, you may need to have a larger sample size just due to the complexity of that particular device. Um, you know, again, it doesn't, this document doesn't require that you have a justification for the sample size used, but it is not a bad idea to have one. And I, you know, I would recommend just having some sort of verbiage uh, prepared for why you feel that the sample size used for your disinfection validation uh, is appropriate. And those are the, the two main updates with disinfection validations. Uh, not a lot of updates, but um, uh, uh, not, not as, as extensive updates as with cleaning validations, but still update, you know, some updates nonetheless. I'll now just go uh, briefly into the updates surrounding sterilization validations. As mentioned before, most reusable medical devices go through steam sterilization or moist heat sterilization. Um, and so a lot of my, a lot of the updates um, that I'll discuss today surround 
uh, steam sterilization validations of reusable medical devices. Just as a quick overview, steam sterilization validations are performed by first uh, performing the sterility assurance level or SAL validation using either the half or full cycle parameters of your sterilization uh, procedure. Uh, and that will be done three times, followed by a dry time validation with the full cycle parameters. Again, that is done uh, three times in total or three runs. And then finally, there is temperature profiling using full cycle parameters where a temperature profile is made of the chamber and of the devices uh, using the full sterilization cycle parameters. So the major update that we saw or that we've seen recently is again stemming from Amy TIR 12, which was updated in 2020, which states that minimum drying times for steam sterilization were removed from uh, table B1 and Annex B, uh, meaning it, there's just no recommendation for what your minimum drying time should be. We typically see uh, 20 minutes being the common uh, starting point during a dry time validation. Now, the next update is that the next revision of ISO 17665 uh, was published this year um, in just in March, just last month of 2024, and it is currently in the process of being adopted by the US FDA, by the US. Uh, another update to, to keep an eye out for, um, it's not published yet, it is in, um, uh, it's a work in progress, is a new AMI TIR, TIR 116. And this is a, uh, a TIR that will give guidance on product adoptions and pro product families for steam sterilization uh, validations. And then lastly, ISO 22441 uh, was a document that has been published um, and has been recognized by the US as a consensus standard. And it is a a document that provides information on uh, low temperature vaporized hydrogen peroxide or VHP sterilization. So if your device can't, cannot withstand steam sterilization, the, the, the parameters of a steam sterilizer, uh, then you, know, you may want to look into this document and uh, you know, explore the use of vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization. So those are the, the major updates with steam sterilization. Uh, definitely not as extensive as uh, cleaning um, and not anything major, uh, you know, not anything major compared to disinfection or the cleaning validation process, um, but just some new documents that I would recommend looking into and some, uh, and a new document to keep an eye out for um, as you are preparing to um, uh, uh, start your sterilization validation for a uh, reusable medical device. Now, the last part of the presentation that I want to go over is just gray areas of reprocessing validations. Uh, these are areas uh, that are open-ended questions that aren't necessarily, um, that don't have necessarily clear guidance in any of the current standards or guidance documents out there. And we'll go over just some examples of these, you know, these what we've called gray areas, these open-ended questions, and some possible solutions and recommendations that uh, we would make. So the first gray area that I wanna go over is just uh, single-use devices. And what I mean by single-use devices um, are not devices that are um, supplied ready to use. I am referring to single-use devices that are supplied as non-sterile to the user and require the user to process them prior to use. So it requires the user to perform cleaning and disinfection or sterilization on these devices prior to use. Uh, and I wanna bring this up because these devices are within scope of the FDA guidance document that was published in March of 2015. Uh, additionally, uh, the, these devices are, you, in scope of AMI ST98. So this is a, an excerpt from the scope section of AMI ST98. And in the inclusions, you can see that uh, this document applies to all devices that require cleaning prior to each clinical use of that device. Now it doesn't necessarily uh, explicitly state single use devices that are supplied non-sterile, 
um, I would say that it, it implies that these sorts of devices are within scope of this document. So what does that mean? What does um, that mean for cleaning validations? What considerations should you make if you have a device like that falls into this category? How do you do a cleaning validation? Do you need to perform those simulated use cycles that Brianna mentioned? You know, what sort of test soils should be selected? What should the endpoints of your testing be? Um, and what additional biocompatibility test, you know, do you need? Uh, these are questions that you'll need to ask yourself. Now, <clears throat> for us, we would most likely say that simulated use cycles are not needed because they're not being reused. So we don't need to account for any accumulation of soil over repeated use because they're just being cleaned and sterilized once and then used. So, you know, those wouldn't be required. Test soils, they haven't been used on a patient yet, yet. So using a blood test soil may not be appropriate or, uh, you know, a, a uh, test soil that mimics the use of the device probably wouldn't be appropriate. And you would want to use one that mimics, you know, how the device is presented to the user prior to cleaning. So maybe something that mimics skin contact. Um, and then with biocompatibility, you'll just want to make sure that uh, you account for the cleaning that's done, being performed at the healthcare facility prior to use and making sure that these, the detergents that are being used to clean the device are not uh, going to you know, cause an issue in relation to biocompatibility. Uh, something to consider as well is that there are unused, uh, there are some single use devices that are unused and reprocessed, things like implants, um, you know, such as bone plates and screws, often of various sizes, not all sizes are used during a procedure, and those unused implants may be reprocessed. And you'll um, want to ensure that you have a, a cleaning procedure that covers the cleaning of those products. You want to make con similar considerations to above, or as, as I've mentioned above or earlier. Uh, you'll want to make sure that you, uh, you want to look into creating a, a system to track how many times that implant's been reprocessed and then you'll want to account for that reuse of that implant during the biocompatibility testing as well. Um, there is a draft FDA guidance on single, unused single-use implants, uh, bone plates and screws specifically, that you can reference. But again, this is just a draft guidance. It's not a published guidance yet, so it's not necessarily one that can be fully referenced. The next gray area that I want to talk about are just devices used for clinical trials. These are devices that are being used on patients during clinical trials and they need to be decontaminated in between. However, these decontamination procedures are not necessarily going to be reviewed by a regulatory body or the FDA. And so what does that mean? How do you approach these sorts of validations? Do you need to do a full cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization validation as if uh, you're about to submit this, uh, these data or the, these validations to the FDA or a notified body, or can they be, be abbreviated studies? We would recommend that the validation activities for these sorts of devices that are being used during clinical, clinical trials uh, would match typical cleaning, sterilization, and disinfection validations, uh, meaning you're, you're going to treat it as if you're submitting the device for review and you're ready to market the device. Um, I, we would not recommend doing abbreviated studies. We, um, you know, we want to make sure that these devices are safe to be reused during these clinical trials. And so the best way to do that is to follow the full recommendations found in the current published st standards. And then the last thing, uh, the last gray area that uh, we want to discuss are just at-home use devices and wearable devices. These are devices that often are single patient use but are still reused. You know, they fall within scope of the FDA guidance document and also within scope of AMI ST98 as uh, they are uh, devices um, uh, that have clinical uses, um, you know, at home. And what are, you know, and some considerations to make for these sorts of devices are that uh, you need to uh, ensure that you have cleaning and disinfection methods that are available and appropriate for at-home use. You don't want to be using disinfectants that are going to be difficult for the, ev the everyday average person to acquire. You want to make sure that the cleaning procedures and disinfection procedures are appropriate and they're not going to be extensive and require additional 
uh, complicated uh, materials or supplies. Um, you know, if your device is a wearable, you'll want to account for, you know, how long the device is in contact with the patient, how many times it's being reprocessed. Um, you know, does the, you know, are there reprocessing residuals left on the device that are going to cause an issue, you know, with, uh, in terms of biocompatibility as the patient wears it for long term. You're going to want to also figure out how to determine the frequency of decontaminating the device. Uh, you know, how often should the patient decontaminate the device if they're wearing it um, most of the time? Uh, you know, <clears throat> those are things you're going to have to consider. Typically, we see, you know, to instructions to decontaminate the device um, as, uh, as contamination is seen or, or visible that, you know, to recommend to have the end user clean the device. Uh, another thing is, you know, how are these validations going to be performed? As Brianna mentioned, you know, ISO 17664-2 seems to allow for their combination validations to be performed, you know, to combine the cleaning and disinfection validation into a single validation study. Um, as a lot of these devices are going to be processed um, as a single step process, they're going to be using, you know, a, a disinfectant that will act as a cleaner and disinfectant and they're gonna be wiping it as a single step process. And so perhaps the uh, validations can be performed as a single step process as well. Um, you know, when it comes to the cleaning and disinfection validations of these devices, I would refer to AMI TIR-12 uh, and AMI ST-98 um, for just the current guidance and that FDA guidance document from, F from 2015. Now, if you have a reusable medical device that you're developing, I would definitely recommend that you refer to the standards here. Uh, there are a lot of standards out there concerning cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization of reusable medical devices. Uh, but definitely be, be aware of them and familiar with them as you're developing your reusable medical device. Uh, thank you for joining today, and I'll turn the time uh, back over to Sean. Great, thanks, Griffin, and thank you to both of you for that thorough and informative presentation. Once again, don't forget this presentation will be archived on mpomag.com for a year. Now we'll have the Q&A session. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. The first question we have is, can the cleaning agent be the same as the disinfectant? Yeah, so as, as mentioned earlier, that is definitely a common occurrence for non-critical devices. So again, these are devices that have either no patient contact or will contact intact skin. Uh, they will typically be cleaned and disinfected with the same product. So something like a super sandy cloth, as Brianna mentioned, or cavi wipe um, or bleach wipes, uh, you know, they will be cleaned with that wipe and then disinfected with that same wipe. Now, when you go into semi-critical devices, uh, that is not the case. Your disinfectant will not be the same product as your cleaning agent. Your cleaning agent for semi-critical devices will most likely be a detergent, you know, like an, an enzymatic or alkaline detergent. And then your disinfectant will be a high-level disinfectant, um, such as, uh, you know, a, a glutaraldehyde solution or an OPA solution or a parasitic acid solution. Uh, but for non-critical devices, it is common to have cleaner, the, the cleaner be the same as the disinfectant. Okay. The next question we have, how do you perform point of use cleaning if the device is used on the body continuously, i.e. 24-7? What is the recommended cleaning frequency? Yeah, so... There, there is no guidance on how to determine what is the recommended cleaning frequency for uh, those sorts of devices. Um, you know, typically we see either kind of two recommendations to clean it daily um, or to, you know, clean it as visible contamination is seen. Um, in terms of point of use processing, that typically refers to kind of the initial processing steps to not allow contamination on the device um, prior to kind of the full cleaning and disinfection or sterilization procedure. Those, those point of use processing procedures are not typically validated um, or a part of the validation process. Really, you're, you're focusing on 
uh, just the cleaning process um, and the, the sterilization and disinfection process uh, without the aid of that point of use uh, processing step. Okay, we have a, another question. Uh, other than the endpoints called out in ISO 15883, do you see any emerging clinically relevant endpoints in the future? Um, no, there, there hasn't been much discussion in the industry of new uh, clinically relevant endpoints. Uh, more so, there's been more discussion of kind of removing endpoints. Um, I don't, um, if you noticed in ISO 15883-5, uh, it had bacterial endotoxin as an as an appropriate endpoint. However, Amy ST98 does not have that as an appropriate endpoint. That was removed um, as it was deemed within that standard as not being clinically relevant. Uh, you know, additionally, cleaning validations used to be performed using microbial methods, or sorry, cleaning validations used to be performed using microbial methods, but that was later deemed as not as appropriate as um, you know, looking for protein or, or total organic carbon residuals. And so that was removed. So we haven't necessarily seen a lot of discussion of adding new uh, clinically relevant endpoints, more is just kind of uh, refining and, and narrowing down the endpoints that we currently have. Okay, appreciate that. I just pushed the slide uh, live that was uh, appropriate for when this question was asked. Can you just clarify what HAI stands for? Yes, yeah, that, sorry, that refers to hospital acquired infections. Perfect, and uh, Sarah, if you could just get us back to the Q and A slide. The next question we have is, uh, the combination approach you mentioned from ISO 17664-1-2021, is it also accepted by the FDA? That is a good question. So we have seen some uh, feedback from the FDA, some pushback on doing that combined approach. So if you are marketing in the U.S., uh, you know, with the FDA, then, you know, we would recommend either reaching out prior to doing validation testing to see if they would accept that approach or to still perform them as separate validations. Okay, great. Uh, another question, what solution do you use to mimic skin contact? Yeah, so typically, you know, th there's a few um, options out there. Uh, we often see the use of what's called British test soil. Uh, we use that to mimic skin contact along with um, there's artificial sweat out there. Um, really, just depends on um, you know what what really the full contact is um, and what's available and what's appropriate. Uh, but we have used artificial sweat, uh, um, you know, along with some bovine serum as well um, to kind of mimic that skin contact. Okay. Uh, another question. Wow, we still have more coming in. This is great. Uh, with the updated guidance to test the four orgs separately, is it necessary to go back and repeat testing that was previously performed with combined orgs? Oh, if you've, if, um, I would say uh, if you have completed your disinfection validation testing and it's been accepted, uh, you don't need to go back. Um, and do any uh, uh, testing to, for, for the organisms as separate inoculums. Um, only if you were to resubmit the the uh, the device or the you know if you were trying to resubmit with a change, uh, you might be asked to revalidate. But if your device is currently on market and you are not necessarily resubmitting um, or, or making a change to the device, uh, then uh, you know, we have not seen a requirement to go back and revalidate. Okay. Uh, another question. What would be the specific soil agent for sweat? Would N NACL count? Um, we, I, I have not seen NACL used. Uh, for, again, for, for sweat, you, you can purchase artificial per perspiration or artificial sweat, and that's kind of what we would recommend is to 
uh, purchase that and use that. Okay. Do you need to perform the six S? Sorry, the six X sim use cycles if you are performing high level disinfection testing only and no cleaning. No, so those simulated use cycles are only applicable to currently or, or are only required currently for cleaning validations and not disinfection validations. So if you are only performing a high level disinfection validation, then you do not need to perform those simulated use cycles. Okay. Fantastic. Do you have to validate all cleaning agent slash disinfectants listed in IFU, or is it considered sufficient to only validate one? And based on that claim, that it proves that the design material or material of the device is possible to reprocess? That is an excellent question. And I will say in regards to cleaning, we do see it being appropriate to validate just one type of uh, detergent, you know, like validate an enzymatic detergent or an alkaline detergent, uh, and then allow the hospitals to use whatever specific type of enzymatic detergent or alkaline detergent, um, you know, whatever they, they use for the cleaning. Uh, we do see that that's appropriate to be a little bit more generic for the cleaning process. Now for disinfection, uh, we do see the requirement that for every disinfectant you have listed in your IFU, you will need to have a validation for each one. Uh, the reason being that each disinfectant is different. Um, even among similar ones, the active ingredient concentrations are different uh, and the contact times are different. Um, and so for every disinfectant that you have listed, you will need to have kind of uh, the validation data for each one. Okay. The FDA guidance seems to be outdated now, particularly with applying Spalding classification risk to cleaning validation approach. Do you know if the FDA guidance will be updated? Um, I have not heard about anything concerning the FDA guidance being updated. Um, that, that is an excellent question. It is, you know, almost at this point, 10 years old, with, um, uh, which is kind of wild to think about, but uh, we have not heard of uh, any updates being made to it right now. There, there is talk about uh, maybe modifying the Spalding classification, but I don't have necessarily any details on what that looks like. Okay, great. What soil would you use for devices in contact with exhaled patient gas, such as a ventilator? Typically, um, we would recommend using a similar soil uh, test soil that will be used for a device that's coming in contact with a mucous membrane. So again, this this would be um, that British test soil that I mentioned earlier. That is a common one, a common test soil we use for devices that come in contact with mucous membranes. Um, and we typically recommend that for gas pathway devices such as a ventilator or CPAP equipment. Fantastic. Well, appreciate all the questions. If you have any additional, I encourage you to reach out to Griffin or, or Brianna or both of them. Their emails are, are there on the screen. Uh, unfortunately, though, that is all the time we have for today's presentation. I'd like to thank our presenters, Brianna Barber and Griffin Kamek, for their insights. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Nelson Labs, for its support. Finally, I'd like to thank you, the viewer, for attending this session. I hope you found it to be a valuable experience.